Reading the comments section on countless number of our videos over the last year, the general consensus seems to be that real-time strategy is a sub-genre of game that is conspicuous by its absence on the Switch. Northgard is looking to fill that vacancy whilst wrapped in a layer of Norse mythology. Does it come through? We're about to find out. Before we do jump in though, a quick announcement that there will be details of how to enter the Divinity 2 giveaway in one of our videos at the end of this week. Now thank you to the developers for this review copy and let's get started. There is a story mode included and it tells the tale of a clan of Vikings looking to move to the fabled and newly discovered Northgard. Before they can embark on their journey, the whole clan, bar one member, is slain by a rival clan who take the map and a trusted heirloom whilst they're at it. The sole survivor swears revenge and so the adventure begins. So as mentioned, Northgard is a real-time strategy adventure that sees you charged with growing, developing and maintaining a village of Nordic travellers. You begin by picking from one of six clans. Each clan has a specific starting bonus and additional bonuses that you will earn as you play. First and foremost, you will need to develop the village by having your villagers create the buildings that allow for the necessary growth. For example, building new houses will increase your village's maximum population, but this is only possible by first building a woodcutter's lodge, thereby allowing you to cut enough wood to craft the aforementioned amenities. Once you have built such a place, you must assign one of your villagers this particular job and you do this by pressing the X button over the newly erected structure. Building scout camps will give you the capacity to explore the neighbouring lands and any new areas you find that are uninhabited can be claimed by colonising them, which comes at a cost of some of your food stock. The aforementioned food stock is built up by building fishermen huts or a hunter's lodge on any land areas where there exist the appropriate resources, such as deer or a river. Building fields and assigning citizens to become farmers will also increase food production. The balancing act here is that some of these food revenues will only be good during certain seasons, such as farming in summer, whereas others may not yield so high a stock but are good all year round, such as fishing. The food stock of course needs to be kept at an adequate level to feed your people and you can stockpile more as your village grows by building food silos to store excess reserves in. Happiness of citizens is another factor and must be monitored and this can be increased in a number of ways. Providing the basics such as enough food and wood, especially as winter approaches, will keep happiness at a decent level but building amenities such as a brewery will increase this happiness further still but of course at a cost of more resources. These are all classed as common buildings and there are more available which I won't go into, but I do want to touch on the military buildings. Your most basic unit in this category and the first available to you is the training camp. This will develop warriors that can defend your village, but also allow you to attack any clans that you discover based in the vicinity of your borders. More buildings become available as you progress and you can even set up subgroups of warriors to send on different missions by entering the military menu with a press of the L button. You can upgrade your warriors over time so that they are more proficient in battle as you fight tougher enemies. The final mechanic I'm going to go into is that of lore. Lore can be acquired by training a villager to become a lore master, but can also be found in other ways such as when scouts explore ruins or shrines. Lore can be exchanged for perks on your skill tree, allowing you to produce a higher percentage of wood early on or for your warriors to do more damage, to name just a couple. More perks become available as you progress and gain more knowledge. If you are partaking in story mode, then you will need to meet a basic objective for each chapter in order to complete said chapter and move the story along. Once you complete a chapter, replaying it at a later date will unlock new side objectives for you to attempt adding some longevity to proceedings, and there are 11 chapters in total to complete. Choosing to play in single player rather than story mode is no different in terms of all of the key mechanics that I've mentioned so far, but the major difference is how you win. Rather than finishing a chapter's objective and moving on, you instead attempt to achieve one of the different victory conditions, much like in something like Civilization VI, which is of course also on the Switch. The four main conditions are domination, fame, trade and wisdom. A domination victory is gained by destroying the town halls of every other clan on the map. A fame victory is earned by claiming enough territory and increasing your game ranking to that of king. A trade victory happens when you raise your commercial influence to a certain level. And finally, a wisdom victory is achieved when you become the wisest clan leader and receive a certain number of blessings from the gods. 
Whilst there are a number of menus to navigate, shortcuts to learn and conditions to understand, the game does feel quite intuitive. You are talked through the early stages and the shortcut buttons will help you to acclimatise to the game early on. It can still feel a little overwhelming when messages are flashing up about needing to build new houses, stock up on food for winter and a warning that you are under attack all at once, but you will learn to prioritise using the aforementioned shortcuts to help you get to where you need to be quickly and effectively. There is also the bonus of being able to choose the size of your map, ferocity of your opponents and type of victory conditions when starting a game, so there is nothing to stop you beginning small and learning the ropes this way. There is also an online multiplayer mode for up to 6 players and although I couldn't test it for this review, it will include all against all or team modes and most importantly will have its own dedicated servers. When creating a match you can choose to set between a public game or invite only, allowing you to have friends join you. Gameplay is deep and pretty challenging, there is a lot to learn, I've only really scratched the surface with what I've mentioned and it's fun attempting the various roads to victory and it receives 18 out of 20. Whereas controls translate over surprisingly well with an abundance of shortcuts to help you. It does take some getting used to and finding key information within certain menus is slow going at first but on the whole they receive 16 out of 20. When assessing visuals, let's start with the positives. A zoomed in view of your village will show the villagers hard at work, bustling around between buildings, chopping down trees or fishing. The buildings have a good level of detail with barrels of fish stored outside and smoke escaping out of the hole in the roof of the longhouses where a fire has been lit inside. Battle animations are fully played out and the weather effects really bring the game to life, especially the transition to winter which is really quite beautiful to watch. On a more negative note though, there are performance issues. When zoomed out, there is some memory loading stutter and unfortunately this is quite frequent and you've probably seen it in the video already. You will notice the frame drops as the screen pauses momentarily and I would estimate that things are running somewhere between 20 to 30 frames per second in these occasions. When zoomed in, it appears to be above 30 and is noticeably smoother, although there is still some stutter. On a personal level, this didn't affect the enjoyment of the game. The gameplay is such that this won't really hinder you while playing, hence the reason the gameplay scored quite well. But at the same time, it is an issue, it's very frequent and people who will be spending a decent slice of money on this need to know what they are getting as it could still be a deal breaker for some. I sincerely hope this game receives a patch as it's the only real major negative that could be levelled at the game as it is. Another slight issue is the size of the text. Now I'm short sighted and I struggled to read the text when playing in docked mode and had to wear my glasses which I don't normally need to do for games on the TV. Whilst the writing is still small in handheld mode, I didn't find this as bad with my particular affliction but just wanted to raise it as I can see this being a potential issue for others as well. Audio wise, the music has quite a calming yet haunting quality to it at times. Whereas at others, it is as bombastic and action oriented as you would expect. It does at times have quite a blunt and jarring loop, sounding almost as if it stops midway through the track and starts again, whereas at other times it fades out more naturally as you would expect it to. Visuals are clean and crisp with a nice level of detail but are marred by poor performance plus text that some may find difficult to read and it scores 12 out of 20. Audio is appropriate and certainly complements the on-screen action, it's just a shame that the track loop is sometimes dealt with in quite a heavy-handed manner and it scores 17 out of 20. Northgard costs £31.49, €34.99 or $34.99 and for this money you are getting a story mode consisting of 11 chapters, the single player mode with a different number of difficulty settings including the Ragnarok mode that goes all the way up to extreme difficulty, a number of achievements to aim for and of course the multiplayer mode which will have those dedicated servers. If you have been looking for an RTS to play on the go, this game cartridge could quite conceivably live inside your Switch for months at a time. It's a shame that the high production values are tarnished slightly by poor performance and whilst it doesn't really affect gameplay, it's a high price to pay for a game that has such an issue and value scores 17 out of 20. 
To conclude, Northgard does so much right in terms of its gameplay. It's a deep, challenging and fun experience which fans of the genre will lose weeks, months, possibly even years to. With a wealth of options, including dedicated servers for online play, there's a lot to like here. Performance is disappointing, and there's no escaping that. We are not talking occasional frame drops, they are frequent, and if a patch is released to address this performance, then add another 4 or 5 points to the final score. And even with that said, let me make it clear that unless performance issues are something that put you off a game on principle alone, it's still a fantastic game that's well worth considering. Northgard receives a switch up score of 80%. Many thanks everybody as always for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, please do remember to leave a like if you did. Just another quick reminder that there will be the chance to win a copy of Divinity 2 and details of that will be included in a video later this week. A quick thank you to our Patreons as always for your continued support and to each and every one of you for watching our videos and as always take care and happy gaming.